the concept that Bill Powers brings in to explain these processes is what, what are called modes. And this doesn't involve adding extra boxes or, or suggesting new components. It's merely about um, directing the way that information is transmitted between the levels of a hierarchy. So what Bill Powers invokes is some switches, essentially, um, and some ver very minimal local storage, which he, call, which he calls memory. Um, but in doing that, you get the emergence of four different modes, which um, Powers calls controlled, automatic, passive observation, and, and imagination. And I just, I just always, every time I read through this, I get really excited and interested by how you can sort of observe different things that are going on um, that have been studied in psychology by looking at these, these four different modes. And again, it's not to say this is the final word, but it's, I think it's really important to think that once we have a model of psychological function that is about hierarchical control, and you introduce these, these, these switches, you can actually get something that's, that, that functions in a much more complex and rich uh, way. Okay, so, so Bill Powers makes a real distinction about memory, and he defines it as the storage and retrieval of information carried by neural signals. So it's just the storage of, that, of those signals that are going through the loops that we've already modelled. So it's not merely having that information in the moment that you see when we did say the live block diagram, but having some component of that block that allows it to store a history of the signals that have gone through it. And therefore, according to the Powell's definition, definition because memory is storage of those neural signals within a loop, it's nothing to do with the, the organisation of how those loops were connected to the world. So it's a separate process from the kind of reorganization learning that we see um, in the system as a whole. The other thing that he proposes there is that we, do, we know that storage and retrieval must be reversible in the sense that we must be able to easily remember things and then, and then access that memory very readily uh, for us to, to function you know, when we're asked to recall things or when it's useful to recall past memories. Um, and therefore, Powell's concludes that memory must be a local phenomenon. It would be far; it would take up far too much effort and processing to somehow take all that information from these little hierarchies and send them somewhere else and then send them back again. For him, the most parsimonious thing that memory would be is a very local little storage within each of, within each of, the, of those units. So what he does then is add a little memory of perception to each of those units. And there's some interesting properties of memory in, in these units, which I'll show in a moment. Powell says that replay perceptual signals are subject to the same interpretations given to the original signals or present time signals. So because all memory is, is just a little storage locally of the same perceptions that 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 unit works on in a real time sense, that immediately tells us that memory and perception are interwoven and interlinked with one another. And that um, it's actually relatively subjective and takes quite a lot of um, processing to, to distinguish between the two. Um, and we'll, I'll revisit this when we talk about dissociation. But there are some really interesting findings within um, basic cognitive psychology. For example, in the field of source monitoring, whereby people are asked to uh, remember a series of words and to generate a series of words themselves. And there is a significant amount of error whereby people misremember things that uh, they generated as memories and vice versa. So we see this real sort of potential confusion between um, the perception and, uh, and the memory. And in clinical conditions, we, we find that people, or when people are in particularly stressful situations, they can perceive their memories as though they're actually happening. 
So, for example, I've worked with many people with social phobia who have images of themselves in a, in a very negative light. They might be sweating profusely, they might be blushing, they might look weak and defenseless. And that image is coming into their mind. They don't actually question whether that image is accurate or not. They just assume, probably not even consciously, that that is how they appear. So, but when you ask them about it, and there's research, really interesting research looking at this, to really tell you more about that, that image, and then ask them when the first time was that they felt like this, it generally happens to, to uh, relate back to specific occasions when they felt uh, very anxious or very uh, nervous, blushing, etc. for the first time. And so there seems to be evidence in clinical studies that imagery, often imagery that we hold to be true, is actually there because we've had a past experience that's, that's led us to believe it. So, for example, someone with social phobia may have been humiliated in class by their teacher, and they've got a laugh, and that, although they, they knew that they had that experience, they haven't linked it to the fact that when they're anxious at work, they get this feeling that they're blushing and everyone's look at them. It's actually a memory, so they're actually taking that as perception as this is happening now. Uh, we see this in post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly. We see it in instances of dissociation, which I'll cover. Um, so there seems to be this, this um, tendency for perception and memory to be confused with one another. And for me personally, that makes complete sense if the two systems are, are sort of superimposed on one another. Um, and sometimes what we find is that people can be so immersed in uh, attending to these inner experiences that they become what we call self-focused, uh, become detached from the situation around them. Um, again, we'll come back to that when I talk about dissociation. But clearly, even though there are these, there are these difficulties with memory, memory must have a function. Anybody want to hazard some why it might be adaptable to have memory in a, in a hierarchy? Okay. Why, why memory might be most important? What's the, what are the key things that we need for our control hierarchy to work? What's the most active ingredient of control hierarchy? Describe And reference values are what we want to experience. Okay? How are we going to know what we want to experience unless we've experienced some of it and it achieved what we wanted or it at least um, didn't lead to anything bad? So our, our memory essentially provides us with potential reference values, i.e., they provide us with potential goals. And again, clinically, we um, we revisit this. Uh, and one thing we do when we're working with people with long-term conditions is they often want to, they want to get, they want to either get back to normal or be normal. So they've lost the sense of what normal is for them. Um, and spend a fair bit of time trying to try and get some perceptual sense of what normal feels like or would look like for them. For some people have maybe a real difficult history, they've got no sense from their own experience of what normal is. And so they have to look in their current experience or maybe look at um, stories or, or people they know or films to try and identify a sense of when they would know they're, they're being the person they want to be. Um, because up until that point, they may be driving their, their lives around avoiding being the person they don't want to be, or the people around them they don't want to be, rather than heading towards a reference value of how they really want to be. And in our work with bipolar disorder, we call this the healthy self. And often it's a bit of an amalgam of some nice, pleasant past memories, but also some new bits of information they've brought in from what they've read on and from what they've seen. Um, so the idea is that memory is goal directed. It's there either to help us. Ideally, it's to help us to have more of what we've had before that's going to work for us in the future as well. But sometimes we use memory in the opposite way to try and not get the things that we don't want anymore. So 
which may have will have a function when it's a real threat. So when you know um, you have a child who's stepped out in front of the car and has almost got knocked down, and it's made you very anxious. You've suddenly got this real uh, reference value for cars heading towards you, where you want that to be as minimal as possible, so you're extremely vigilant when you're about to cross the road. That's a very adaptive thing to have if it's focused just on crossing the road. However, if you've if you've grown up in an environment where um, you've um, had caregivers that have a driver being abusive or manipulative, um, and that's your own model for how other people are. And so whenever you relate to them, you try and avoid either being like that yourself or being like that, then it interferes with, with relationships because this is a very high level global concept. It's controlled at a high level and hierarchy. It's having a big impact on your life. And life is focused on a particular thing you need to avoid to survive in that situation. And so for that reason, we help people to sort of start to replace that reference value of avoiding it in a certain way with one of what they want to head towards in a more sort of constructive way. Does that make sense? And I'm going to a very global sort of point here, but I hope it's hope it makes sense. Okay, so but I think the going back to the goal directed aspect, um, increasingly research in cognitive psychology is illustrating that memory is goal directed. We use our memory to achieve our goals, and we also remember the things that we need to remember and that fit with our goals. And again, what I think is just really exciting is that the role of memory in PCT already preempts that because we know that the first function, according to PCT, of, of the mind is to achieve goals and to gain control. And then we use, potentially use that memory or use our memory of experiences to um, achieve more fluid and adaptive control over things. Okay. Um, and Powers used a, an idea called associative addressing, which was around in the literature at the time, to indicate how this, basically trying to make it as simple as possible, how this memory might be accessed. Um, so now, this is basically a... Um, very, hopefully most of this should be quite familiar to you as a, as a negative feedback loop. Uh, a certain point in the hierarchy, so he's, he's drawn it where you've got uh, the high levels above and the low levels below. He's drawn one example of a unit from the middle. We've got all the familiar aspects in here in terms of inputs, comparator, outputs, perceptual signal. But what's been changed is this spot in the middle, whereby the perceptual signals that are going through are not only going up to the high-level systems, but there's a little local storage of that perceptual signal in memory. And actually, when, according to this adaptive model, when you get a reference signal coming from the level above, it's actually triggering a little memory of, of a past perceptual experience at the level that you want, that would be the, at the desired level. And that is what's being compared to current perceptual so it would be um, a you're feeling tense, you want to feel more relaxed, and so your reference value for trying to be more relaxed might be how you felt when you were on holiday. And so you might be using that memory that you have of when you're relaxed on holiday as your reference value to compare with your current perception. Okay. And the other group with the key elements that from this is the, are these two switches. One switch going up from the perceptual signal, which switches would really dictate whether the perception goes up to the next level or not. And another switch coming down between the memory and the comparator, which um, dictates whether that signal going down affects the levels below, or, as in this example, it's, it's actually looped around. Because if there's two switches like this, you can have you can have four different modes. Because one can be open, the left one can be open, the right one closed, the right one open, the left closed. They can both be open, or they can both be closed. But just having those two switches from that emerges four different modes that this system might work. Okay. 
the one mode is pretty easy because it's the mode we've been doing all, all the time. The control mode is when both those switches are on, okay? It's just working just like the unit that we've been modeling already. So that's the one that's blank, okay? And in the control mode, all signals, all input signals are going up and all output signals are going down in the continuous way we've described. But these switches allow for three other modes which um, Powers explains in a bit more detail. Just hand in on that, I think that should be all. Makes sense. Okay, so I know this is pretty detailed, but do bear with me, it will all sink in. Um, so the top left one there is a control mode, the default mode is two way connection between levels, dynamic high level control. Basically, it's as though there was no, no boundaries really between um, how high level you could think of your goals and how low level you could put them into practice. And so in an ongoing way, you're adapting and changing, which is the, the basic mode we've already been talking about. Then on the, uh, on the right there at the top, we have the automatic mode. And in this, in this mode, there's the... The lower level systems are using, as a reference value, the, the memory of past experiences. And there's no need to keep on, the, the information is not, doesn't need to go to the high levels um, in order for that control to work. So the idea is that we can work in automatic mode when we're engaging in some kind of routine or habit or skill and we don't need to access at that time, the reason why we're doing it. Okay? We don't need to go up a level, as it were. And so, presumably, those things that we call unconscious or automatic are operating in that kind of way, whereby the lower levels are generally. I mean, this can go up to <coughs> the levels, but we don't need the, the level above where we're acting out certain routine in order just to engage in that routine. So that's the automatic mode. The passive observation mode is where information goes upwards into the high level systems, but there's no signaling going downwards to exert control over that perception. Okay. And the idea is that this is what your, I mean, there's some automatic things going on here as you're writing and typing. But probably this might be the prevailing mode of the moment when you're in the lecture, or when you're reading a book, or when you're sitting in a park and looking at things going around. That it is possible to take information in, take perception in, even if it goes against your your goals at the time, or, or you know your values or your understanding, and take that information in and exert control later. So you might be after this lecture, sort of questioning it and talking about it and thinking about it and trying to sort of um, enact it. But we, but we know that, that it seems to be the case that people have this capacity to take in perceptual experiences without necessarily exerting control but over them as they're happening. Um, and so we would say that would be, that's what Powell calls the passive observation mode. And I think it, Hopefully you can see the functions of these things. So the automatic mode is to be able to get on with all kinds of things without having to disturb your high level thinking, just as you are with your, your writing and your um, making notes, etc. Passive observation mode allows you to take information in and observe perception unfolding over time without necessarily acting and just immediately trying to reduce the error to get it how you want it to be. It's that delayed gratification or that delayed um, um, impulsivity. It's, it's that, that ability to, to sustain your perception of something because you may find that if you, if you keep it there long enough you might actually find that it does make sense or that um, it fits into some idea without you having to exert control at that moment. Um, and then finally we have the imagination mode which I think is the most interesting which is where both of these loops are switched off. And this essentially separates, creates separations between levels in the hierarchy. <coughs> uh, 
And now these lower level systems can carry on doing what they're doing. The high level systems don't need to be sending out um, commands for what you're doing with your behavior. They can be sending out uh, reference values which are looped back into your own perception. So you're essentially having things in your mind, you're perceiving things that you've generated yourself. And you'll be generating them largely from your own reference values. So you're, if I ask you to imagine a rabbit or imagine a cat, there'll be your, your sort of classic reference for what a rat or a cat or a rabbit or a familiar cat or a rabbit that you might have at home looks like, that'll come to mind. And, and when it's coming to mind, that means that it's looping back into your own perception. Um, because now, in the imagination mode, you don't need to actually see a rabbit, you can actually just use your, the reference value of it which you've stored. Obviously, you would have have to have seen a rabbit or a cat in the past to develop that reference value. Um, but it, this allows us to self-generate our own perceptions and do things in our heads whilst the rest of our mind and body just gets on with what it needs to do. It's why when we're driving, we can be thinking and planning and imagining, for example, or while you're um, writing, you can be questioning and weighing things. Um, and there's a really, really um, interesting, I mean, this is, looks very complicated, but it sh probably shouldn't to you guys now, because it is just a bunch of control units and different layers of them. This was actually drawn by um, Bill Powell's late wife, Mary. Um, and one of the purposes of doing this was to illustrate where the imagination mode can happen and how that can maybe modify the kind of things we're imagining and the nature of that experience. So on the left here, we have a full the controlled mode where all the connections are going down right to the environment and right back up again. On the right, there's two examples of the, of the imagination mode. One at relatively looping at a relatively high level, maybe at a um, program level, for example, where we might experience it as thinking and planning in a relatively symbolic way. But then the other example is looping to a lower level, and which um, now is called hallucination or vivid dream, or maybe mental imagery. So the idea is the same process happening, we're controlling perception internally without using behavior because of the short circuit, but because it's looping at a lower level in hierarchy, got a different quality to it and it feels like imagery or uh, a vivid dream rather than a sort of thinking plan. So in PCT, because we've got this hierarchy, we don't need to necessarily make artificial divides between thinking and planning and uh, imagery and hallucinations and in this in this way because what what are described by those terms may be emerging from the way that we can sort of we can do engage in some imagination over different levels and have a different quality depending on what level it is that we're having this passive experience. And there's a there's a quite a large research area now on what's called mental simulation within cognitive psychology. Um, this is essentially mental simulation. And Bill Powell talks about this in his chapter, how useful it is, obviously, to be able to imagine um, an experience before you then go and carry it out, and how that operates as a way of sort of testing things before you then actually implement uh, the plan. Okay. I mean, I know it's a lot of detail, but it's the things sort of some of these things familiar from what you've seen in other areas of psychology and to fit in. So, just to revisit those modes again. Um, in the control mode, you have this two-way stream between the higher and lower level systems. Uh, you're, you're, you're actively engaging in, in the higher level goals that you're already thinking about. Um, you're learning, changing, reorganizing in an ongoing way. So it's, you would think it might be the most adaptive thing, but the problem is that it takes up the, the whole hierarchy, the lower and the higher levels. You wouldn't be able to engage in any other acts while you were thinking, um, but it may be what we see when people are talking about being in a, in a very sort of in 
really focused concentration, better concentration, where, the, where every component of their mind is worked towards the same goal, uh, rather than sort of this slightly more patchy experience that we have in everyday life. The automatic mode is where, where these low order systems are controlling our perceptions without access to the higher order systems or without sending signal, signals up to the high level systems. Allows behavior to achieve pre selected goals automatically. I put they're very common in everyday behavior driving, walking, dancing, speaking, effective for multitasking, dividing attention. Essentially, a lot of the stuff arguably that we do um, and take for granted is operating in this automatic mode. You don't need to go up levels with it. But clearly, as we talked about in method of levels, there can be an issue here, which is that all of these um, reference values that we're using at a lower level are, are memories rather than um, actively being changed. And so if suddenly some routine or habit that we've been engaging in becomes unhelpful for us, we might just carry on doing that unless we actually start to question the reasons why we're doing that, engaging in that habit or routine or behaviour in the first place. Uh, or at the very least, we might need to change and balance when we're doing these different skills and actions, uh, which again would need to go up there. So it's it's a very efficient mode, but but it's it's very rigid. And, and require, it's going to require some controlled modes and some other modes to be modified. Pass observation mode, this is change, lower systems allowing change in input without controlling them, allows a person to take in information without exerting control, like I was saying. And we talked there about learning information, observation. Maybe this is the state that's described as mindfulness and acceptance in, in therapeutic approaches. So that all sounds pretty <coughs> important and, again, a very adaptive mode. Um, but you've got to bear in mind that if you are just passively observing things, you're not exerting control and you're not reducing error. And so at some point, you may need to, to revisit those experiences and, and learn some way of coping with them. And it may be that you also, we also get this experience when we're as an experience, an extreme experience of being very passive when we're being controlled or manipulated by others. Uh, and we know that a criterion of post-traumatic stress disorder is a sense of helplessness and lack of control. And we also know that one of the most um, clear symptoms of PTSD is intrusive recurrent memories of experiences that have happened. And so, and that, you know, at one point I'd love to be involved in some research or paper on this, but it, 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 from a strategic perspective, what might be going on is rather than hopefully this lecture, which isn't going to be too offensive and distressing and dangerous, and you can passively observe it, if you're passively observing something that's actually very detrimental and harmful <coughs> to you, like in a situation of trauma, then um, that perception that you've taken into the system is going to, it's going to cause errors with how you see yourself, with whether with your, your with maintaining survival, for example. And so you're going to have to revisit those perceptions and control them. Um, and so maybe that's why they come back to us uh, within the imagination to be so called reprocessed. The idea of what we're doing is that we're trying to work out why, how we're going to control this thing. And again, um, there's interesting research in the area of trauma of what makes people resistant to traumatization. And very often it's about exerting control within the traumatic situation that makes them resistant to trauma. So a person who's being held hostage but is always thinking and planning their escape and managing to achieve it. So a person who's always trying to, who can actually retain control over um, some sense of themselves whilst things are happening. Um, so again, the literature, you know, to me would, would lend itself really well to this. And again, we could also sort of argue that Again, this is getting very speculative, but potentially if, if a person has had unpleasant experiences of, of passive observation in the past, during school, during early childhood, they might be less able to <coughs> sit and concentrate and manage and take information in, in, in this kind of 
Barclay situation. So, um, and there is a very interesting association between attentional difficulties such as ADHD and various um, forms of uh, attachment problems. So, anyway, food for thought in the future. Uh, imagination mode. This is where the high-level systems are controlling their perceptions without connection to low-order systems, i.e. without behaviour necessarily in the environment. So you can have things going on in your head. It allows mental simulation, planning, in mental imagery. Again, sounds really useful thing to do, really effective. You can plan things ahead. You can see in your mind's eye whether things are going to work out or not before you risk doing them. <coughs> and I think this is a integral mode for doing therapy because most of the time in therapy you're just talking hypothetically about what, you, what you're going to do or what you might do that week so we need to hold that in mind to do it. Um, but there was a, some problems with this. One is that these mental simulations are just based on our reference values. They're not based on the actual situation. So if our references are inaccurate we could be preparing ourselves for things that might never happen as I'm sure you're aware of what happened to someone with uh, pathological worry, for example. Um, and so we're still going to have to update that internal model with in real life. And then the other issue with it, which I'll talk about in a bit, is how our imagination mode can become disconnected from the rest of our functioning, whereby it's used almost as a method of arbitrary control rather than actually as a way of solving your future problems in the world. <coughs> 